Praise the Lord, everybody. Did anybody come to praise the Lord tonight? Why don't you stand to your feet and let's give him glory in this place. Come on. We serve a great God. We serve a great king. We serve a great looter. Did anybody come to lift up the name of Jesus? Did anybody come to worship and magnify and glorify the Lord? For he is righteous, he is holy, and he is king. Come on, somebody lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody lift up the name of Jesus. If you know that he's worthy, we come to lift up the name of Jesus. We come to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's celebrate our King. He's the ruler of everything. Let's lift his name on high. Come on, Zion, we praise our king. Let's celebrate. Celebrate. He's the ruler of everything. Let's lift his name on high. Come on, Zion, we praise our king. Come on, somebody lift your voice up. Shout out to God with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah. He's worthy of all praise. He's the Lord God in ancient of days. Let's lift his name on high. Come on, Zion. We praise our King. He's awesome and glorious, excellent King. He's worthy of all.
Somebody give him the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I like that song because it says, what, is, what does it say about Zion? <laughs> what does it say? <laughs> where, is, where it tells, lift up, like sing with me, let us go unto Zion. Right? And it reminds me of when the Israelites would go up into the house of the Lord. They would be singing and dancing together. And it was a, it was a building moment to where your family's going to church with my family. I'm walking out of my house and I say, oh, that's, that's uh, the cast over there. Let's get on the road to Zion. We're going up to Zion and we're walking down and we see, oh, there's the Prendergast. There's the Mondragons. There's the Vergara family. There's the Elder family, the Pound. Let's go to church. I like that line because it's encouraging all of us. Let us go up, not down, up into the house of the Lord where there's healing and breakthrough and blessing. And God makes a way where there seems to be no way. And he provides for us. And we receive revelation of who he is and who we are because of him. Amen. Is anybody happy to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Is anybody thankful you decided to come to church on a Sunday night? Now, how many of you, how many of us have the faith tonight that God is a miracle worker? Let me see you raise your hand. All right. How many of you have seen him work a miracle? Anybody seen God work a miracle? Now, what's the difference between when he did it, when you saw it, and your opportunity tonight? There is no difference. We've got faith. We will ask. We're at the point of our service where we are bringing our needs, specific needs, unto the Lord. And we've got faith. His presence is moving in this place. His word will never change. He is still the healer of every disease. He is still Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is still our healer. Amen? Amen. So as you're coming tonight, I want you to think about that time. You saw God work a miracle. And come on, challenge yourself. God can do it tonight. Amen. God wants to do it tonight. Amen. Does anybody believe that? God wants to work a miracle in your life tonight. He wants to mend the brokenhearted. Now bring your needs unto the Lord. The elders of the church will lay hands and let's pray together, church. Maybe you're not, com you're not coming down for a specific need, but you know somebody else that has a need. Come and join us tonight. Jesus, we praise you. We thank you for your word, Lord. We put our trust in you tonight. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you are a promise keeper. You're a way maker, our deliverer. Thank you, Jesus, for your word that is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, God. You never change, Jesus. You are able to do it, God. You are able to see us through. You are able to open the door, God. You are able to heal us and deliver us. Jesus, we ask in faith because we understand who you are, God. We understand, Lord, if you've done it before, even if it was thousands of years ago, you're still raising the dead today. You are still opening the blind eyes today. You are still unlocking the deaf ear, the lame to walk, the dumb to talk. You are still pouring out the Holy Ghost tonight. Let's give him the praise. Let's give him the glory and the honor that he is worthy of tonight.
you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for being our way, Merck. Thank you, God, for making a way every single time, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, that's it. Why don't we thank him for being a way maker? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. While we were singing that song, I was reminded of a scripture. I believe it's in the book of Luke, and I don't know the reference off the top of my head. But it's early in Jesus' ministry, and he goes into the wilderness with his disciples to escape the crowds. The Bible says, I've never seen this before until this year, the Bible says that the crowds follow him out into the wilderness and they find where Jesus is at. And then the Bible says what we were just singing. The Bible says that he began to heal them and he healed them all night long. I'm thankful for a God that doesn't go to sleep. He doesn't have quitting time. But I can go to him at midnight. I can knock on the door at midnight and say, Father, I need bread. Father, I need you to heal. I need you to move. I like songs like this one because it says, even when I don't see it, when I don't feel it, when I don't understand it, when everything around me says it's not happening. If God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, come on, all together. Why don't we thank him? God's working on your behalf. Even on a Sunday night on Mother's Day, when we're all just a little bit sleepy from lunch and the nap, God's still working for you. God's still moving for you. Why don't we thank Him? Come on. Let's thank Him. Thank you, Jesus, for being a miracle worker. Thank you, Jesus, for being a promise keeper. Thank you, Jesus, for being my light in the darkness, my nightlight in the midnight hour. In the storm, in the raging storm, God. In the chaos of this world, Jesus. Thank you for being the rock of ages. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, we're going to do something just uh, a little bit different than what we've done. If you would please be seated. And I'm going to ask you to stand here in a minute. But I want to remind us to continue to invite people to the house of God. A sower must go forth to sow. And if God's giving you seed, and he is, if God's giving us seed, he's giving it to us for a reason, and that is to go out and to sow. Now, there's a great way you have an amazing opportunity to sow this week. We are entering our HCAP explosion, and that is this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And there will be outreach Thursday evening, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday, this Outreach, but it's a different form. It's called a church service. Maybe you've never heard of that, but church service is kind of an outreach. <laughs> I'm being facetious. All of us here have heard of a church service. So there's a great way that you can be involved into sowing seed. And uh, Brother Ari Prado preached a message, a powerful message, and he entitled it, Where He Goes When You Go. And he talked about how there is a verse In the New Testament, where Jesus commands his disciples, he says, go out and preach the gospel. And when they leave, the Bible says that Jesus then turns and goes to the home cities of the disciples and begins to preach the gospel to the families of the disciples. They didn't even know it. They were out somewhere else preaching the gospel. I believe that this week and really every day, As we thrust our hands into the kingdom of God, that God can go to places that we cannot go, and he can speak to hearts that have been closed to us, that are closed off to us, and he can minister. So we invite you to be a part of that this week. It's going to be a wonderful time. Friday night, uh, Evangelist Greg Godwin will be preaching to us. It's just going to be a great week. Bishop Greg Greg Wilbanks will be here Tuesday night. Got to get all these names right. Bishop Greg Wilbanks will be here Tuesday night, and it's going to be a wonderful time. You do not want to miss that. And then the explosion will kick off Thursday evening with outreach into Friday with outreach, and there will, there will be devotions. You're invited to all of this. Even if you haven't done Hope Corps, you're invited to be a part of every bit of what's going on. And then Friday night, 
Evangelist Greg Godwin will be preaching to us Sunday morning. Sunday night he'll be preaching. And then the following Tuesday he'll be preaching as well. I'm believing. I am believing with everything inside of me that God wants to pour out the Holy Ghost throughout this week into next week. And I believe that it can just continue right on through. So we invite you to be a part of that. But with that being said, if you... We're not, and I know some of us are, and it's going to be kind of hard for the choir. Choir, if you want to participate, just raise your hand when I ask this question. If you were not teaching a Bible study or participating in a Bible study two years ago, because this is about when we started doing this, two years ago, would you please stand? So if you think back two years ago, you had never taught a Bible study or you were not actively teaching a Bible study, then would you please stand? Stand. I know I wasn't. All right. Now, you may be seated. We're going to do this one more time. I'm doing this. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But I want us to see something. Now, in the last two years, if you started teaching at least one Bible study a month or you are actively involved in a Bible study, would you please stand or raise your hand? This is why almost every single week, the ministry of this church, you can remain standing. We're going to go into the offering. In fact, why don't we all just stand? We're going to go into the offering here. But this is why on almost a weekly basis, the ministry of this church is coming before you and asking you to teach a Bible study. It is not hard to teach a Bible study, I promise you. Yes, you're going to get nervous. Yes, you may say the wrong thing. Yes, you're going to get questions asked to you that you have never heard before. But that's the point isn't that you go into a Bible study knowing everything. The point is that we are reaching out. And if you begin to notice, as this church, more and more and more of us begin to reach out. And more and more and more of us begin to sow and begin to preach the gospel. Not behind a pulpit, but in the street. To our friends and our families, to our neighbors, our co-workers. As more of us begin to do that. God begins to add more and more. And now we're reaching a point where people are getting the Holy Ghost. That's why we do this. That's why we do this. The Bible says he gives seed to the sower. If you don't feel like there's any seed in your life, then get whatever seed you have left and get into the harvest and begin to preach and teach people. And I promise you, if you start using the seed that you have now and God sees you using it, he's going to give you more. So I encourage you. Teach a Bible study this month. Even if it's five minutes, you can do it on Zoom. You can do it through a phone call. You can use Signal. You can use WhatsApp. You can use FaceTime. You can teach a Bible study. I believe 100% of us can teach a Bible study this month. And the more of us that do it, the more that God is going to pour into our lives and into what this church is doing. So I encourage you, I implore you, teach a Bible study this month. Now, that's all the announcements, except for there is a bake sale that continues. The bake sale has been so good, it's been going on all day long. There is a youth bake sale that continues after church. Please, just go over there and just buy the whole table out. You'll love it. You'll think it's great. You'll be in a sugar coma all week long. I was already snacking on some of the goodies this week or today yeah this week well this week today at lunch and it was excellent so buy those on your way out all the money goes to support those that are going to peak now that's all the announcements why don't we take a few minutes why don't we greet each other in jesus name welcome each other to sunday night live
Praise the Lord, everybody. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we're making our way back to our seats? Are you thankful for his goodness and his mercy? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We've been talking a lot about miracles and singing about miracles tonight, but I don't know if many of us may not know, but God did a miracle this week in Pueblo through Christian Growth Center. Sister Carrie's stepfather, Rick, was in ICU, and they were, if I'm not mistaken, talking about end-of-life decisions, and it was pretty critical, and the church prayed, and I believe Brother Mitchell went and prayed with them, and I think maybe Bishop went, and the next day he was awake. He was off a ventilator. He was off of life support systems. We still serve a mighty God who's still healing and working miracles. Amen. And I'm thankful to be a part of what God is doing. Amen. Let's read our scripture together. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. And thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Let's bring it cheerfully this evening. Come on, somebody give them glory in this place. Come on, we serve a God that cannot be killed. We serve a God that reigns forever and ever. Come on, put your hands together. Oh, hell.
ago there was a song that was written that actually was written by an apostolic man it said Jesus be the Lord of my life Jesus be the Lord of all of the kingdoms of my heart how many of you want to sit the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne of our lives I don't want to be running down to Babylon and learning how to make their altars I don't want to be running down to Syria and learning how they worship. I want him to reign. How many of you want the Lord to reign over all? Somebody give him another high praise right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise God. Again, I remind you that tomorrow, this week is a busy week. But you know, back in the day, this church, this was the genetic of this church. We were sold out. Dear God, we were here for everything. Y'all didn't know this, but Brother John Cass still has a drug problem. His mom drug him to church. She drug him to work days. She drug him to outreach. But I guess it worked. Because here he is with his family still involved in the kingdom. You want to learn how to stay in the church? Get involved in the church. Get your life out of the world and get it in the church. And you don't have to worry about staying faithful to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so it's a busy week, but we're used to busy weeks. Monday night is prayer. Tuesday night is church. Wednesday night is your day off. Thursday is starts our our outreach I guess all of the quizzers don't have a day off because is that Wednesday is quizzing I don't see brother James and sister Tina are they okay they out of town praise God I always miss brother James and sister Tina when they're not here some of you think you get away you don't I'm a shepherd remember hallelujah I count the sheep because I have to give an account to God so, uh, but uh, quizzing, we love our quiz, we love our quizzers, we love that. So that's going on Wednesday, Thursday as we get into the Hope Corps alumni outreach 
I think we have 5,000 door hangers that we need to get out. Brothers and sisters, in all honesty, we can do that in one night. It really is a case. You don't know it, but when my wife and I first came here, she probably don't want to remember this, but her and myself and Sister Gloriana and I think, I don't know, Sister Carla, you may have been involved in this. This was so far back. In like two weeks, we passed out 25,000 phone books in this city. And that is the way that we purchased the first new carpet for our old building was passing out phone books. And, uh, and there were people that were in that church that they had made up their mind that they were not going to cooperate. Back then, the Lord had given me a vision of what he was going to do here. And I made up my mind, if it kills me, we're going to put new carpet in this church. Make a long story short, we paid that church off in five years. And it was eight months behind. And here we are paying another building off. And I got my eye on another building right now. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because God is doing great things in Pueblo, Colorado, and, and we're just thrilled about it. We want Brother Mitchell to come tonight. We want him to preach the Word of God. How many of you are going to get with Brother Mitchell Elder as he brings the Word of the Lord to us tonight? to Acts chapter number 4. Excited about what God's going to do this week. I'm excited about what God's doing right now. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 31 is where we will take our text. Once again, I wish every single mother in this house tonight a very happy Mother's Day. I'm thankful for my mother and for her mother and my father and his mother and his mother's mother and his mother's mother's mother and my wife and her mother You know, none of us would be here without a mom. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. So I give honor to each and every one of you tonight. Very high honor. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of the things that you mothers do that never, no one ever even says thank you. And a lot of times, especially growing up, we take it just for granted it's just there the clothes just get clean I don't know they just are clean and they just show up in your room and it's like wow I threw them on the floor dirty and they came back clean brother Hicks the Lord does miracles I threw dirty clothes on the floor and a week later they showed up clean and ironed and pressed and folded things like that thank you very much for the things that you do Acts chapter 4, verse number 31. The Bible says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And I'm going to do my best tonight to preach from verse 23 through 31, our text. The title I give us for the sake of remembrance tonight is this title, When They Had Prayed. When They Had Prayed. And why don't we do that together right now? Why don't you lay your Bible down or your phone, whatever was in your hand, and all together, Christian Grow Sinner, why don't we take the next 30 seconds or so and why don't we pray and ask that God would speak to each of us tonight. Jesus, thank you for your peace that's in this room and your victory. 
Thank you for every single person here tonight, God. Every single person connected to this church. Every single person that will hear this in the future. Jesus, your word does not return void. Let your word do tonight what you have said it to do, God. Give us ears to hear your word tonight, God. Give us a mind that would understand your word tonight, Jesus. Give us an open heart to receive your word tonight in this house. Anoint our hands and our feet, Jesus, to obey your word. God, would you teach us to pray as you taught your disciples, Jesus, over the next years of our life. Would you, wherever we are in our prayer life, God, would you take us deeper? Would you take us higher, God? Would you teach us to be more effective in how we pray? Would you teach us to pray your will, God? Would you teach us to pray the things that you need done, God? Help us to see past our wants. Help us to even see past our needs, God. And help us to see, see into the infinite potential that you have, that you're calling this church to. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Everyone said in Jesus' name. You may be seated this evening. Acts chapter 4, and verses 1 through 22, the last time we preached out of this in expositing those 22 verses, we dealt with there is a hidden miracle that takes place in Acts chapter 4. And we talked about that, how that miracle is... That the Holy Ghost, Jesus living inside of us, could take someone like the Apostle Peter, who was so backwards and so shy. Now, he wasn't when he was with Jesus, but when Jesus was removed from the situation, that he was, in fact, intimidated by two young ladies and an unnamed servant that was a part of the party that arrested Jesus. And so while he sat by the campfire as they continued to confront him and say, Hey, you were in the garden with Jesus when we just arrested him a few minutes ago. He didn't even have the courage to preach to them. And yet somehow he finds the courage by Acts chapter 4 to stand before the most powerful Jewish men in all of Israel and to proclaim the name of Jesus in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now we know that the Apostle Peter, he got that through the Holy Ghost. That's what Jesus told him. He said, go tarry in Jerusalem and you will be endued with power. And when you read in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, you find that the Holy Ghost was poured out on them. So this isn't the message tonight. This was the message then. But let me re-preach it for 30 seconds. If you're in this house tonight and you need power, let me encourage you. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost in your life. You need Jesus, the hope of glory, living inside of you. And that's what gave Pat Peter the power to go from being a coward to being someone of great boldness and strength. And so we pick up. In verse 23, we pick up where they are leaving the Sanhedrin and this questioning that has gone on. And the Bible says, and being let go. So they were let go. This time, nothing happened to them. They were threatened. They were told, hey, if you keep preaching the name of Jesus, there's going to be some serious consequences. There's going to be some serious action brought against you. But according to the law, we can't really touch you. So we're going to let you go. And so, and being let go, they went to their own company. And that's an important phrase. And being let go, they went to their own company. The company that we keep matters, Christian Growth Center. The company that you're constantly around, it matters to God. It matters who your friends are. It matters who your associates are. Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 16, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. The apostle Paul is giving clear grounds that if there's someone 
that it keeps coming around the flock and they're causing division and they're sowing discord and they're preaching false doctrine. Mark them and avoid them. That's not my words. That's the words of the Apostle Paul. Now, does that mean that every person that's outside of the faith, you just, well, I I haven't heard you speak in tongues for a week, so you're out. No, that's not what that means. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is people that perpetually cause division. They do it on purpose. People that are sowing discord. People that are constantly gossiping. People that are constantly trying to get you to question the word of God. The Apostle Paul said eventually there needs to come a time where you say, Hey, look, I love you. But until you get some things figured out personally, we're going to have to just part ways. And then in the contrary, the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Philippians 3 and 17, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them, same words, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an example. So the Apostle Paul, in in dealing with this, the company that we keep, he said, hey, those that are sowing discord, those that are preaching false doctrine and causing division, avoid them. And while you're marking those people and avoiding them, find people that are in love with the doctrine. Find people that are in love with unity and that are constantly speaking faith. People that will believe in you and people that will speak faith into you. Mark those people as well and hang out with those people. Those are the people you need to be around. That's what... That's what is in this phrase. They get back to their company. And then they report all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. So they begin to talk about, hey, this is kind of what went down. And then virtually everything that we are going to talk about tonight is in a prayer. Um, in fact, one of the theologians that I read over the last couple weeks, maybe a couple months in studying to preach this, it's been a little over a month since I preached out of Acts. One of them said that you can make the argument that this is part of this prayer is actually a song. Now that's an interesting thing. I'd never heard that before. Not everyone said that. Not every book that I read was in agreement with that. But he does make an interesting case that part of this could be a song. And then really when you sit down and think about it, the worship service in Christian Growth Center is actually just a continuation of pre-service prayer. In fact, it's the next step. Pre-service prayer is a great time for us to come to the house of God and get ourselves right before the service ever starts. That way, by the time we get to the end of the service, we can pray for all of the new people that are coming in and the people that don't really know how to pray and how to repent. We've already got through us. We've already prayed through in pre-service prayer and in the worship service. And by the time we hit altar call, we're freed up. We don't have to repent. We already did that. I get it. There's times where God speaks directly to you in the sermon. And so you, you go to the altar as a response to that word. But when you, when you understand what the Bible teaches about praising God and singing, they're all prayer and singing are not different. Some of the most beautiful prayers that you will read in all of the Bible are in the book of Psalms. They're songs. They're worship choruses that David wrote when he was in the depths of despair. And he was in the heights of victory. He would write these songs and he would pour out his heart. So whether this theologian is right or not, it is an interesting idea that he puts forth. Verse 24 says, and when they heard that. So verse 23, they get freed up. They make it back to their company. They make it back to their group. Verse 23, the end of it, they say everything that went on. And then verse 24 opens up with the entire congregation. This is important. The entire congregation, the entire group of people there, not just Peter, not just James, not just John, not just Bartholomew, not just Andrew, not just Judas. Not Judas Iscariot. He wasn't there. But the other Judas. It wasn't just the disciples. It wasn't just Mary, the mother of Jesus. It says, and when they heard that, the entire congregation that these two apostles came back to, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice 
to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. So the first point of this sermon is it matters It matters who we hang out with. And the second part, the second point, if you're, you're doing your little points when you're putting your sermon together, the second point is that it matters who we lift our voice up to. We shouldn't just lift our voice up to anyone. We shouldn't just dump our problems on anyone. Knowledge is a heavy thing. You don't think about that, but knowledge is a heavy thing. And it matters who we lift our voice up to. Jesus taught this in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end. This is the point of this parable, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Jesus gives every Christian two options. You can pray or you will faint. He doesn't leave middle ground. He says men ought always to pray and not to faint. So Jesus is telling me when I read that, Mitchell, you can pray or you can faint. He tells every Christian you have two options. Prayer is not negotiable in the life of a Christian. Men ought always to pray. Always. When you're sick, when you're well, when you're rich, when you're poor, when you're whole, when you're broken, when you're encouraged, when you're discouraged, when you're cast down, when you're lifted up, when you're on the mountaintop, and when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, men ought always to pray. And the promise from Jesus is, if you are always praying, you will not faint. You feel like you're weak in your body? Get on your knees and pray. You feel discouraged? Get back in the prayer room. You got questions? Find a place of prayer. This is the point of this parable. The whole reason Jesus is talking about this widow woman is that we ought always to pray. Look at your neighbor and say, always. Always. That was the wrong neighbor. Look at the other one. Say, always. 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 Men ought always to pray. Always. You'd be amazed the places that God will speak to you when you talk to him. You'd be amazed the places that the glory of God fills when you just take the time to talk to him. You'd be amazed you could sit at a gas station and the Holy Ghost hit wherever you are so strong that you can't continue. You can be laid out in a mechanical room trying to fix a boiler and all of a sudden you're speaking in tongues and you're weeping. Why? Because you took the time to pray. God is no respecter of persons and God is no respecter of locations. He's just looking for the person that will always pray. We have two options as Christians. We can pray or we can backslide. There is no third option. Saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, It's always interesting when the Bible lets you peek into the soul of someone. It doesn't do it a lot. But this is one of the places where where God in his word allows you to see into the mind of someone. Into the inner man. He said within himself. He didn't even say this out loud. Though I fear not God nor regard man. Yet because this widow troubleth me I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, he finishes this parable and then he looks at those listening and he says this, hear what the unjust judge saith. In other words, pay attention in this parable, pay attention to what the unjust judge just said. What did the unjust judge just say? He said, lest by her continual coming she weary me. 
And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry unto him continually, which cry unto him day and night. He's tying it back to what he just said, that men ought to always to pray. In the daytime, we should be praying. In the nighttime, we should be praying. When you drink your morning coffee, when you wake up, some of the first words out of your mouth should be, thank you, Jesus. Even if the coffee's hot and it burns your tongue, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this day. And some of the last things we should say before our eyes close in sleep is, God, thank you for this day. I am continually praying. Why? Because Jesus said, pay attention to what the unjust judge said. And her, her nagging, if you will, her plead, her cry, her petition was continual. Not when she felt like it. Not when the weather was good. Not when life was good. Or not when life was just bad. It was continual. It was in the days when her adversary was up in her face. And it was in the days when her adversary was all the way across town. And had never even talked to her every single day. Every single chance she had. She was standing before the judge saying, avenge me. And it reached a point where the judge said, okay. Now this is modern language. But he said, I am sick and tired of this woman nagging on me. She's going to weary me. And so I'm going to give her her petition. Though I fear not God nor regard man. And then Jesus says this in verse 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? There are some times that God will answer your petition the first time you request it. But there's other times that he bears long. And we don't always have all the answers while he, why he bears long. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, There was a thorn given to me in the flesh to buffet me. The, the Greek means to literally smite him, to hit him. And when you look at what it was, some people think it was physical. Some people think it was spiritual. Paul made it clear that whatever it was, it was an angel sent from the devil. He had an adversary up in his face and he says, I appealed to God three times. Three separate times I appealed to God and said, would you remove this thorn? And three separate times God looked at Paul and said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. So if you got a prayer that you've been praying and it ain't been answered yet, just keep praying that prayer. And until God answers it, realize that God's grace is sufficient for you and that God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. When we're strong, God's, God's strength isn't glorified when you're strong. Why? Because if you're strong enough to do it, you just do it. But when you reach a point where you realize, God, I've been praying this and it isn't happening. And you begin to rely on his strength. Then he is glorified. Verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Now, this is kind of a paradox. This is kind of interesting. He just said that God bears long with us sometimes. And then he said that it would happen speedily. Now, Sister Westberg explained this to me a while back. And uh, she's explained a lot to me. She's, she set me right on a lot of things. Thank you, Grandma. Just having fun. But she really did. We were talking several, quite a while ago. Years ago, and um, she pointed this out to me that when something happens quickly or when something happens in the near future and when something happens speedily, they're not the same thing. You could say uh, service is going to end soon. And it is. I know some of you don't believe that, but it is. And then you could say, service is going to end speedily. I did not just say the same thing. When something's going to happen soon, that means that it's going to happen in a relatively short time span from right now. Service is going to end soon. 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, we're going to be on our way. 
We're going to be headed home. Some of us are going to be grabbing a snack. Others of us are going to go sit at a restaurant and eat. Some of us may go straight home and go to bed. But when I say that service is going to end speedily, that means at whatever point the service starts to end, it's going to happen very quickly. So service ending speedily, you may be in a service that's three or four or five hours long. And when it ends speedily, that means by the time the preacher finally gets around to closing the service out, and he said everything that God has told him to say speedily means it can happen in just a few minutes. So this isn't a contradictory phrase. What it's saying is when God gets ready to answer your request, it's going to happen in a very quick fashion. You may pray something for 20 years and wake up and God fix it all up and make it look all better in about five seconds. It don't take God a long time to do things once he makes up in his mind to do something. So just because he's bearing long with you does not mean that it's not going to happen. It's not our job to question whether it's going to happen or not. It's not. The Bible says that anything that is not of faith is sin. You don't have to have a pack of cigarettes in your pocket to be a sinner. All you have to do is look at the word of God and say, I don't believe that. According to the word of God, as soon as you do that, you're sinning. It's not our job to question whether God's going to do it or not. It's our job to pray continually that men ought always to pray and not faint. Just keep praying the same prayer until God avenges you. And then it's fascinating that the Bible says the disciples went to God and lifted up their voices with one accord. They're in unity. And then they say this, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. They're putting their problem in the right perspective. They're viewing their problem through the right lens. You see, if you come to, if you come to this problem in the text... With the incorrect lens, then you're coming to the problem in the text and you're saying, okay, Peter and John just told off the most powerful people in Israel. Now, they're not the most powerful people. They were under Rome, but they were the most powerful people in Israel, definitely in the city of Jerusalem. They're the rulers and the elders of Israel. The Sanhedrin traces its roots all the way back to Moses when he elects 70 and he puts them in chart. That's, this is the Sanhedrin follows all the way through all that. Okay, so this is an old body. Now, the people aren't that old. They're, you know, this is new people from the Old Testament. But it's old. And so if you're looking at this wrong, you're like, well, he just told off some really powerful people. Kind of like when you look at your drug addiction and say, you're not going to control me anymore. Well, well who, what gives you the right to set? Well, you've been bound for 25 years. Well, if you got the right, if you have the right lens, if you're looking through the lens of faith and you're understanding who your God is, that's what they're doing right here. They're saying, yes, I understand that two of the apostles just told off the most powerful court in Israel, but we're serving the God that made the land of Israel. That's what they're saying. God, which made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that fills this. My God's not just a local God. He's a global God. In fact, he's a God that fills all in all. That's what gives me the power to look at my addiction and say, no, I'm not going to submit to you. Why? Because my addiction is not more powerful than my God. That's what they're doing in this text. They're rearranging the problem and they're saying, no, the Sanhedrin is not the most powerful thing. God is the most powerful thing. Your addiction is not more powerful than your God. You just got to see your God right. Your bills are not more powerful than God. Your sickness is not more powerful than God. That's why when the music starts in a service, you forget about your sickness. You forget about your addiction. You forget about all of the trouble. And your hands get raised and you say, God, you're mighty. You're big. You're great. You're immense. You're powerful. What are you doing? You're rearranging the problem. You're getting things right. Yes, the problem may be bigger than me, but it's not bigger than my God.
This is what they're doing. They're setting the context right. That God is bigger and more powerful than the Sanhedrin. And so when we have a problem with them, we're going to appeal to the highest power. This is the beauty of prayer. This is the beauty of prayer. That an omnipotent, omniscient God would sit in all of time and space, would feel all of the vastness beyond our imagination and would give me a sinner and a wretch the grace to walk into his presence to come boldly before him and to say Jesus I need you to move and he will not only hear my petition if I pray according to his will he will answer my petition Prayer is not your last resort. Prayer is your greatest asset. Prayer is the most powerful thing that you can do. Prayer should not be on the bottom of the list. Prayer is not after you go to the doctor. Prayer is not after you get a second job. Prayer is not after you file for divorce. No, prayer is always, always the first thing a Christian should do. Oh, why don't we pray right now in this house? Come on, for just a few minutes. Come on, why don't you access the throne of God right now? If we ever understood the power of prayer, if we really understood uh, the places that you can step, uh, you can step past all of the walls you can step past all of the tribulation you can step into the very holy of holies John was caught up in the spirit and stood in heaven itself the apostle Paul found himself caught up to the third heaven Ezekiel found himself carried to a valley of dry bones why because they were in the spirit John said it I was in the spirit on the Lord's day he was in a place of prayer he was forgotten he was rejected he was abandoned to die on an island Oh, until he stepped in the spirit uh, and God said hey John you've been praying uh, you've been praying and so come up hither I don't know about you but I would love with I would love this more than anything else uh, to hear the voice of God say come here buddy you've been praying uh, let me show you some things in the spirit The Apostle Peter says, casting your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Upon who? Upon who? Them? Her? My friend? My neighbor? My coworkers? No, casting my cares upon him. I get it. We need friends. We need people in our lives that we can truly pour ourselves out to. But oh, what we miss when we step into another gossip session instead of into another prayer room. What we miss when we slander because we're fallen and all the time God's saying, bring it to me. Bring it to me. Bring Bring it to me and I'll fix it. I love you. I love you with all my heart. But you are not omnipotent. You are not omniscient. You do not see the future. You do not speak the future to me like God does. And there comes a point in time where you got to silence the phone and silence the voices and silence the distraction and get alone with God. Casting your cares upon him. For he careth for you. There's many beautiful songs that have been written through the ages about prayer. Songs from just a couple years ago. To dating. Several hundred years back into the past. But one of them... That continually went through my mind as I prepared to preach this today. Last night and this week. 
I'll read just a few verses to you. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins, all our griefs to bear. I got some close friends in my life, but they can't bear my sin. They can't forgive my sin. They can't wash away my sin. They can't bear my grief like Jesus can. Oh, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All because, this is why, because we refuse. We do not carry everything to God in prayer. I believe with everything inside of me, if you stub your toe tonight before you go to bed, you can pray about it. And if you walk out of this house and somebody says you'll be dead in a week from cancer, you can pray about that too. Everything, everything to God in prayer. Every single thing. That's what Peter said. Cast your cares. Don't dump needless weight on your brothers and sisters. Don't dump needless gossip into the ears of those around you. I know we've all done it. But get back to the prayer room. Find a place of prayer. Nobody knows more than the preacher tonight what it's like to say something stupid. You don't believe me? Just hang around and listen to all the dumb things I said as a kid. I know what it's like to get mad and shoot your mouth off. I know what it's like to have people ruffle your feathers and everything inside of you is broken. It's hurt. They stabbed you and you want to release that. Hear me. You can release that. You need to release that and you need to do it to God because he is the just judge. Go to the prayer room. Don't go to your brother or sister. Listen, knowledge. Knowledge is a weighty thing. If I came to you tonight, and I said, I'm going to come down here. If I came to you tonight, and Brother Brenton and Brother Nolan are, they're brothers. Come here, buddy. Stay right here. If I came to you tonight, and say he's not your brother right now, okay? But you guys are really good friends, and I come to you, and he doesn't know we're talking like this. And me and Brenton just got in a fight. Me and Brother Brenton, we just got in a fight, man. And he roughed me up because he's way tougher than I am. He roughed me up good, and, and, and he said some hurtful things, and it may have been my fault. It probably was my fault, <clears throat> and I walk away, and these guys, he doesn't know anything about what just happened. I'm going to show you what knowledge does. Brother Brenton, go ahead and sit down. Thank you, buddy. Come with me. So I get Brother Nolan, I come over here, and man, I'm riled up. <laughs> you know, we've all done it. <laughs> That's basically all you're saying. You're just venting, blowing off steam. Now, what it looks like, if we're talking, I'm, Brother Nolan, that Brenton, oh, I tell you what, man, he, he said some mean things to me. He says he's a Christian, and he said some mean things to me. He ain't no Christian. Did you know what he did? Did you hear what he did? Oh, my God. He didn't, his mom told him to clean his room, and he was like, I ain't going to clean my room. A Christian ain't going to do that. This is what the conversation looks like. But hear me. This is what I'm doing to Nolan. I'm putting more and more and more weight on Nolan. And I can put so much weight on this young man that he crumbles. Go sit down, buddy. Thank you. I can put so much weight in his life that he can't bear up under that weight anymore. And I'm wonder, and I'm guilty of it. I just told you I'm chief sinner in the house tonight when it comes to this but I wonder if I have been the cause of dumping so much weight into somebody's life that they reach a point where they throw in the towel and they walk out of the house of God and it's not because they didn't love God it's because I wouldn't shut my mouth and get on my knees and pray and I dumped so much weight on that person that they broke <laughs> cast your cares on him Cast your cares on him. We should encourage one another. I give you full permission. If I'm gossiping to you, I give you full permission to look at me 
can't say that's gossip. You need to go pray through. We talked about it, young people. That's submitting yourself one to another. We should, have the, we should have the love for one another enough to look at them and say, hey, man, I love you, but I'm not going to talk that way with you because I don't need that weight. I fight myself enough, and I don't need your weight dumped on me. Now, if you want me to pray with you, I'll pray with you. If you want me to fast with you, I'll fast with you till I'm sick. I'll fast with you till I physically have to eat. I'll do everything I can to reach you, but you're not, not going to dump that weight on me. That's what Peter's dealing with. Take it to him in prayer. And Jeremiah, the prophet, cries out, Is there a bomb in Gilead? You don't hear it preached about much anymore, the bomb of Gilead. But I'm here to tell you tonight, there is a bomb in Gilead. There is a healing power. There is a salve that can heal all wounds. There is something that you can find and apply to any broken heart. And it will be mended. But you're not going to find it in just any conversation. And you're not going to find it in just any book. You know where you're going to find it? You're going to find it in the word of God. And you're going to find it when you humble yourself. And you get down on your knees. And you say, God, this is broken. Can you help me fix it? And this is their prayer. Set things right. God's bigger than the Sanhedrin. Yeah. And then the prayer gets really interesting. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, this is verse 25 of Acts 4. Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined a vain thing. The kings of the earth stood up. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord. And against his Christ. This is a direct quotation from the Old Testament. They're quoting directly from the Psalms. Gathered together against the Lord. Against his Christ. And then they exposit their own prayer. Now if you want to learn how to exposit. This is a great example right here. They teach you how to exposit. They go right back and exposit their own prayer and their own verses. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. The first thing that caught my attention as I read this is we've got to realize, Christian Go Center, their beef isn't really with us. Their beef really isn't really doesn't have to do with you. It has to do with the Lord that you've connected yourself to. They rose up against the Lord. They rose up against the Lord's Christ. They rose up against Jehovah's anointed one. And so the Sanhedrin didn't even really have a problem with Peter and John. They had a problem with the name of Jesus. They're there's going to be people in your life that slander you and backbite you and talk about you and put you down and they don't even understand why. It don't really have anything to do with you. It has everything to do with who you're connected to. So don't get mad at them because it's not personal. It's not them. Just love them and preach the gospel and live it and hopefully somewhere God will step past that and reveal to them the same thing he's revealed to you. The Sanhedrin gets addressed one time in this prayer, and it's just, a, it's just a glancing, oh yeah, by them. They don't even name them, them. And I know it's hard, but we can get so focused up on one little problem that we miss the beauty and the glory. My wife and I did something that was probably a little crazy. It was a little crazy, but it was worth it. Friday night, there was... Uh, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, there was a really bad solar storm. Yeah, there was a really bad solar storm, and so, yeah, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to understand that. <clears throat> but what it caused is it caused so much activity with the northern lights or the aurora borealis, the fancy word, and it's the, what all of us normal people call it, it's the northern lights, okay? It caused so much activity with them that people all across the United States could see it. Well, I've never seen it. I mean, I've seen pictures, but it's not the same. So I was thinking about this. My cousin texted us in, in a family group, and he said, hey, this is what's going on. 
And he texts us and he said, you know, this is the days that it's going to happen. And I started digging around. I started looking for it. And I found, hey, if my wife and I drive to the Wyoming border, we'll be able to see this. So Friday night, as soon as church was over, we got in the car. We drove to Wyoming and back. I think I finally went to sleep at like 4.30 Saturday morning. But when we were driving, we reached a point. We reached a point where I, you could almost see it. You could see, you could see something was there. Something was there, but there was so much lights and so much distraction and so much traffic. We were in the middle of Denver, and then, and then we we're in Loveland, and then we're in whatever the city is past Loveland. I can't remember it right now. We're, we're driving through these cities, and you could, you could almost see it. And then out of nowhere, literally, within probably a a 30-second span, you could almost see it, and then off to our left, you could very clearly see that's it. You could, it was vague, but it was there. And we're driving, and we drove right through a construction site. And I began to think to myself, how many of these men realize the absolute glory that is going on behind them? They're looking at a problem. they got to fix the problem. They ain't going to get paid if that road doesn't get fixed. They got to get it fixed in a certain amount of time. I'm not even saying that it was an unjustifiable problem. It was something that needed fixed. It was something that it was okay for them to pay attention to. But they were so focused on that concrete and making sure that that problem got fixed that how many of them missed the absolute glorious representation that was going on behind them and how many times Christians do we get so focused on a problem that may need fix and we may need to fix it but we're so focused on this little thing over here that we're missing the absolute glorious representation we miss divine divine visitations when God steps into the house and he wants to speak to us but we're so focused on one little problem that we miss it's the hour of visitation. This is Jerusalem. This is Jesus before he goes into Jerusalem. And he weeps and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets. How I would have gathered you under my wings. How I wanted to care for you. How I wanted to build my kingdom right now. But because you didn't get it, you have missed your hour. A visitation. Because of that, the city will be destroyed. There won't be one stone on top of another. And in this prayer, it seems like the whole world stacked against them. Then I'm not even going to just read the rest of the text, okay? They pray, the power falls. But I got to get to the end of this. You get to verse 31. It says, and when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. Oh, let me read this real quick. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and slaughterings. That's their one mention. That's the one time they mention the Sanhedrin in this prayer. Behold what they're saying. And grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. They didn't even ask for the Sanhedrin to go away. They didn't even ask for the persecution to go away. They didn't even mention the Sanhedrin by name. They just said, hey God, you see what they're saying to us. Because of what they're saying to us, would you give us the strength to keep doing what we know we should be doing? And how many times do we pray, God, take the problem away? God, remove the problem. Listen, I don't want to get sick any more than anyone else in this room. But if nobody gets sick, then nobody will get healed. And if nobody's born blind, then nobody will, nobody will be given their sight back. If cancer doesn't afflict somebody's body, then we'd never understand that God could heal cancer. If the bills didn't mount up to the point where we couldn't pay them, then we'd never realize that God really can step in and pay your bills in a miraculous way and you not even know where the money came from. They didn't even mention the problem. 
God, just help us. Give us the strength to keep doing your will. Be not weary in well-doing. For in due season you will reap if you faint not. They understood that. If we keep preaching, if we keep witnessing, if we keep doing the things we're supposed to be doing, it doesn't matter who's talking about me. It doesn't matter who's gossiping. It doesn't matter who's slandering. It doesn't matter who's oppressing me. God, just give me the strength to, to keep preaching your word. And when they had prayed, when they had prayed, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. When they prayed the right prayer request, it was answered. Their prayer request was answered. The very next verse, God... Give us boldness to preach your word. They prayed for signs. They prayed for wonders and healing. That starts taking place in in chapter 5. It opens up with the apostles doing many signs and wonders. Maybe, no, hear me. Sometimes you just got to keep praying and God will answer it. But there's other times that maybe God's not answering us because we're not praying the right thing. God wasn't going to remove Paul's thorn. Just get up and move past it, Paul. Musicians, please come. Luke 11 and 1. It says this. They came to pass that as he was praying... In a certain place when he ceased. One of his disciples said unto him. One. One out of twelve. One of his disciples said unto him. Lord. Teach us to pray. You know how. You learn to pray. You're taught. Some of us may look at our children and say. They don't pray. Are you teaching them to pray? Bishop said it today, his earliest memories of his mother and his grandmother, they were praying. That's where Bishop learned to pray. If you don't have someone in your life right now that's actively teaching you to pray, you need to find someone. And say, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. I've heard Sister Tina Salas say it on multiple occasions. When she first got in church... She told me, she said it multiple times. She said, I didn't know how to pray. So you know what she did? She came to the house of God. And Sister Elder and Sister Charity Cast were in here. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning. And they were praying. And Sister Tina will tell you, just like she told me, that's where I learned to pray. I learned to pray by listening to my pastor's wife pray. I learned to pray by listening to one of the faithful saints of God. Pray. You don't know how to pray? Come to family night prayer and listen to people pray. Listen to them pray. You don't know how to pray? Go read the prayers of Jesus. Go read them and get down on your knees and pray them and ask him, God teach us to pray. James said, ye have not because ye ask not. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of the Father who giveth liberally. The only way the new converts coming into Christian Growth Center are going to learn how to pray, church, is if we teach them how to pray. Because that world out there ain't going to teach them how to pray. That world's going to teach them how to gossip. That world's going to teach them how to slander. That world's going to teach them how to doubt. That world's going to teach them how to faint. It's going to teach them how to miss prayer meeting so they can watch sports. It's going to teach them how to get another bottle. It's going to teach them that a needle's the answer. But if there's a church that will come alive and rise to the challenge and say, No, the answer's not in a needle. It's in a prayer meeting with God.
James 5, 16. If we could stand. Confess your faults one to another. Like I said earlier, there is a time to have the right friends. And to speak to them in the right manner. And James makes that clear. Confess your faults one to another. But he immediately steps past that. And he says, and pray one for another. That ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then one of the most beautiful verses in the whole Bible. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. So speaking of Elijah, listen to me. Elijah knew what it was to be suicidal. Just go read his story in the book of Kings. He knew what it was to ask God to kill him. He knew what it was to suffer the spirit of suicide. Elijah knew what it was like to feel alone. Elijah knew what it was like to be hated. Elijah knew what it was like to question his own ministry. To look around and say, why am I even doing this? This whole nation has gone away, God. Elijah knew what that was like, man of God. He knew what it was like when you step out of the pulpit and you wonder, is anybody even listening? Are they paying attention? Elijah knew what that felt like. He knew what it was like for people to lie about him and slander him and cut him. He's just the old fuddy dud crazy that goes off into the wilderness. Elijah knew what that was like. He knew what it was like to feel like even God had left him. Go read about him in the wilderness. He felt like God had even rejected him. He hadn't. But we've all felt that way if we've lived for God long enough. Elijah, he knew what it felt like. No father that we know of. No mother that we know of. We don't even really know who Elijah was. A nothing, a nobody that just comes onto the stage and gets caught up into the heavens. We don't even know if he was an Israelite. Sitting in here and you feel like nobody has noticed you. And you feel like nobody cares and nobody's listening. Elijah knew what that felt like. But thank God Elijah didn't stop with that. It says, and he prayed. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Elijah stepped past all the feelings. He stepped past all the emotions. He stepped past the rejection. He stepped past the suicidal tendency. He stepped past even feeling like God had rejected him. And he prayed. And he prayed earnestly. You know what that means? He just kept praying with fervor, with passion. He just kept praying that it might not rain. That's a hard prayer, Brother Hicks. You know how many people are going to suffer when you pray that, Elijah? You know how many people are going to die when you pray that, Elijah? It doesn't matter. This is the will of God. And so it doesn't matter what I feel like. And it doesn't matter how it affects what's around me. I know that I am to pray this. And so I'm going to pray. And it rained not by, on, the, on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Huh. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. If you do not pray, you will not have power. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. I find it fascinating. And I close. We're done. I find it fascinating (laughs) that Jesus made sure that Luke used this word. Luke 22, 42 through 44. Now it's not Elijah. Now it's Jesus. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel. Luke's the only one that recounts this. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. I promise you, you don't hear this all the time, but there are angels that abide in this sanctuary. 
This is why this is a holy place. This is a sacred place. We don't just do anything in the sanctuary. We don't just talk about anything in the sanctuary. I was talking about it with someone earlier. But it used to be that in some churches, when they even stepped on the platform to clean it, they would take their shoes off. You know why? Because they understood. You still see this in Vietnam. When they go into the church, everybody takes their shoes off. They understand that's a sacred place. There are angels that will come and meet you in this altar as you pray tonight and they will strengthen you no they're not going to remove the cup Jesus but they'll give you the strength to drink the cup they'll give you the strength to drink the cup they'll give you the strength to let them talk about you and keep right on loving them they'll give you the strength to be slandered and kicked out and rejected and abused and he'll give you the strength to love your enemies to do good to them that persecute you and despitefully use you you don't get that in a self help book you get that in a prayer meeting with God in this verse Verse 44, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And when I read that, that's when I thought of Elijah. Elijah knew what it was like to be a man, and he prayed earnestly. Christian Growth Center, it's time for us to get back to praying earnestly. You may already be praying earnestly. No, God help me. But there's some of us that are not. We're not praying earnestly. And I don't know, I don't know if there's ever a point where you reach where you feel like you're praying enough. I, I don't know. You can read the diaries of great men of God that saw thousands of miracles. You read their diaries. I was sick. I only prayed three days today. Or three, three hours today. I was sick. I only prayed three hours today. Wasn't feeling well. I only prayed five hours today. I get it. We live in a different world. We really do live in a different world with a lot more distractions. But you can pray earnestly at your job. You can pray earnestly while you drive a car. You can pray earnestly. And it grieves my heart when I walk in here and I'm praying. And sometimes I should be praying and I'm not. I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to all of us. And I look around. Around, and I see the hollow eyes and I see in the worship service they're not worshiping and I know what's going on you're not praying hear my heart I'm not here to beat you over the head you're the whole reason I'm even here if there are no saints there's no Mitchell elder I'm not here to beat you up I'm not here to even talk down to you I'm chief sinner in the house tonight I'm here to encourage all of us it's time to find a place of prayer it's time to find that closet and unlock it until you pray two, three, four, five hours until you forget what time it is, until you forget what day it is. You pray, you pray, you pray. And when we reach that point, it will not rain for three and a half years. It's time to pray, church. You can come and pray right now if you want. But more than just now, when you wake up tomorrow, it's time to pray. When you're at your job tomorrow and you're frustrated, pray. When that temptation comes to you, the first response should not be be picking up the phone and calling somebody. If you have to do that, do that. But by all, oh, with everything inside of me, let my first response be prayer. Let my first response be to pray. Come on, saints. I know you got it in you. I know I've heard you pray. Some of you, your prayer is the only reason why I'm here. Because you would pray for a knucklehead when he wouldn't pray himself. Don't stop praying just because the knucklehead's 28 years old. Come on, church.
church, I know what it's like to sit in a Monday night prayer and people pray so long that they're drunk in the Holy Ghost and they're laughing and they're giggling and they're out of their minds. Why? Because they just kept praying. That's it. Let's pray. Jesus, wash my heart. Wash my mind. Help me to get back to a place of prayer. Help me to get back to a place of prayer, Jesus. Help me to get back to a place of consecration, God. anything else learn to pray come on young lady more than anything else learn to pray learn to talk to God learn to pray we're gonna have fun we're gonna have games we're gonna do all that we're gonna shout we're gonna dance we're gonna do all that young people but for all things that are good and wholesome let's learn to pray sing praises. We got to do both. Pour your heart out to him. He's listening to you. Pour your heart out to him. Come on, you can talk to him about anything. Pour your soul out to the master.
please remember tomorrow night at 6.30, there's family prayer. You're welcome to stay in the sanctuary and pray as long as you want. Tonight, we need some people that will fast tomorrow. We need some people that will fast Tuesday. We need some people that will fast Wednesday. Thank you. Some people that will fast Thursday. Some people that will fast Friday. Need some people that will fast Saturday, please. Anyone for Saturday? I'll do it. Thank you. Amen. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Amen. God bless you. Love one another. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Please be mindful. If there's anyone that stays to pray, let's please be mindful of those that are in the sanctuary praying. And let's take our, we want you to fellowship, but please let's take our fellowship to the foyer so those that want to pray can continue to pray. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night for prayer.